Yo, yo, hey there. Do you ever think about war? Okay, well, I didn't mean it like that. Do you ever think about console wars? I used to be very political about gaming, but now that I'm a collector, I'm very neutral in my political stance on consoles. I'm not gonna lie, I love games, and I love collecting them. But, I love consoles and collecting them just as much, if not more than games. I love these little stupid machines, the history behind them, controllers, games, menus, everything. So let's take a look at one of them. The original PlayStation. Why the original PlayStation? I don't know, but anyways, here we go. The original idea for the PlayStation came from a partnership with Sony and Nintendo in 1988. Nintendo used floppy disks for the Famicom, so once again they were interested in using disks for games. They were contemplating a CD add-on accessory for their newfangled Super Nintendo that would use Super Disks. There were a few prototypes that Sony showed Nintendo, but they still weren't sure. Now, Sony was already doing quite a bit with Nintendo, providing sound equipment and the sound chip in certain cartridges, and because of that, Nintendo's president at the time, Hiroshi Yamauchi, was becoming skeptical of Sony. They were pushing this deal a little too much, along with Sony's rapid growth in the entertainment industry with music and movies, he was afraid that Sony was going to try and take control of Nintendo. So around 1992, he decided to back out of the deal and just move on with the normal Super Nintendo that we know today. Now, whether Sony was actually planning to try and take over Nintendo like some sort of pirate, or if they were just planning on having a healthy relationship, I'm not sure, but it's fun to think about the possibilities and how different the gaming industry would be if they stayed partners. While the Super Nintendo and the Sega Genesis were battling it out, on October 27th, 1993, Sony announced that they were stepping into the ring of the gaming industry, which was honestly a pretty risky move at the time. The early 90s was a time where everyone thought they could make a game console. The Panasonic 3DO, the Amiga CD32, Atari stepping back into the ring with the Jaguar, and even Nintendo's new partner after the ties with Sony were cut, Philips with their new console, the CDI. They all flopped. Miserably. But was Sony going to stand out among the others? Yeah, I think they did. The PlayStation's launch price was $299, which was significantly less than the Sega Saturn's price, along with it having the same 3D 32-bit capabilities as the Saturn. Third-party developers were very interested in making games for the console. With Sony's rising status in the tech industry, an amazing worldwide marketing team, and with the support of hundreds of third-party developers, the PlayStation was about to become a global, sensational phenomenon. On December 3rd, 1994 in Japan, September 9th, 1995 in North America, September 29th, 1995 in Europe, November 15th, 1995 in Australia, and throughout 1996 and 1997 for South African and Southeast Asian regions, the Sony PlayStation was released. Okay, that's enough history for now, let's actually talk about the console itself. Here it is! Uh... It's grey! Let's take a closer look at this thing. On the front, it's very straightforward. Player 1 and Player 2 controller ports. The PS1 uses 1 megabyte memory cards, and as you can see, they go here. The sides of the console don't have anything going on, aside from being a fun thing to run your finger across. On the back, pretty standard stuff. You got your AC adapter port, your AV out, but there's also these ports on the other side. The serial port, and the parallel port. Now I don't know much about these, but I'll try to explain it. I believe the serial port is for playing multiplayer games, but each person has a separate screen. Kinda like with some gaming tournaments and esports where everyone has their own screen, so just imagine instead of Rocket League, it's Crash Bash. And then there's the parallel port, which I could be wrong, but I don't think there was ever an official accessory made for it. Notice how I said official. Yeah, both GameShark and Action Replay started making devices for players to cheat. It would just plug into the parallel port and there you go. Cheating! Well, I hope you had fun cheating because Sony removed it in later models. On the bottom, there's some neat info and... SQUARE FEETS! The top of the console is just very iconic, very homey, comforting, and simple. You have your power button, your reset button, and the open button, and the disk drive lid, which proudly, yet quietly, has the words, Sony PlayStation engraved. Well, I think it's about time to actually plug this thing in. I've never really done a big fat this for a console, unless you count the, uh, the, the GS5.
Game Station 5. This is how you know it's gonna be good. Who in the right mind would sell this to someone? This is putrid. Dude, I swear if this is another- Yep, this is another matching game. This is awful. I swear this song is going to haunt me forever. This has to be one of the strangest games I have ever played. This is just insane to me. Someone in 2003 made an NES game about an Iraqi war, which both wars had many casualties, and 20 years later, I'm playing it. The GS5 needs to be stopped. Uh... Anyway... This... is the Sony PlayStation. Wow, isn't that just beautiful? I know it's just a boot screen, but come on, that's art. A lot of people talk about the PS2 boot screen, but in my opinion, it's got nothing on this. And while it's not my absolute favorite, yes, I have a list of my favorite boot screens in gaming, it's definitely up there at like top 10, quite possibly top 5. It depends on what PlayStation model you have, mine is the SCPH-7501, but my PS1's menu is this blue bubbly... thing with the two options looking like someone ate a bunch of sprinkles and vomited everywhere. Here we have our memory card menu, which, uh, yeah, I don't have a lot on here. And then there's the CD player. Finally, I can listen to music on the TV. I honestly cannot think of a good reason to use this other than a few specific games using it. I mean, I'm glad it's here and I'm glad it's on other consoles because it's fun to play around with, but yeah, I guess I don't understand the actual use for it. Okay, before we get into games and all that, there's one more thing to go over. The controller. I'll admit I don't have the original controller, I do have the PS1 controller, which is the same as the DualShock, which is just the original controller with analog sticks, which I'm pretty sure is the one everyone used anyway. I don't like it. This controller is too small in my opinion, I never thought I had gargantuan hands, more so ogre dwarf hands, but yeah, it's small and it constantly feels like it's slipping out of my hands. You got the D-pad, the iconic face buttons, L1, R1, L2, and R2, and there's the analog sticks, or the L3 and R3 inputs if you're a literal maniac. Start, select, and the analog buttons, which the analog button just enables and disables the use of the analog sticks. Some people call this the best controller ever, and I think they're either nostalgia blind or have very small hands. It's okay in my opinion, it works fine, but it's just not that comfortable for me. As mentioned earlier, the games were released on CD, so they came in a standard jewel case, but there were also long box games around the beginning of the console's life. PS1 games that required more discs were released in a double jewel case thing. I like the way these things look, but they look weird on the shelf with the double spine thing going on. The PlayStation upon release had a pretty decent lineup for launch titles, but a good chunk of these games were still in the second dimension. They were just warming up and testing the waters of what the PlayStation was actually capable of. There's Rayman, which is a charming 2D platformer which spawned some 2D and 3D sequels, along with spin-off games like Rayman Raving Rabbids, which the Rabbids are part of the Mario universe now. Air Combat, which honestly just looks like a Super Nintendo Super FX game. And there's also another flying game, Total Eclipse Turbo. There's also a few fighting games like Battle Arena Toshinden, Zero Divide, and Street Fighter the Movie The Game. If you want to count that as a video game or hot garbage, it's up to you. So what, a few games released, big whoop, but the question is how big of a whoop? A thousand plus games big of a whoop. Yeah, that big of a whoop. The year 1995 brought us some killer games. There was Twisted Metal, a demolition derby style party game but with guns taped to the vehicles. Nothing screams family game night quite like mentally ill clowns and police officers popping each other's tires. Gex, which was a 2D platformer originally released on the Panasonic 3DO, which let me take a quick look at my graph again real quick, yeah we know how that worked out. It was ported to the PS1 a few months after its original release. The game was praised for being a funny, goofy, fourth wall breaking game. And there was Tekken, originally released in the arcades in 1994, it was released on PlayStation in 1995. A three-dimensional fighting game that was somewhat supposed to rival Sega's Virtua Fighter, which was the first 3D fighting game series. We obviously kinda know who won that rivalry, considering the Virtua Fighter franchise has sold around 18 million units while Tekken has sold over three times that. It's just funny that there's a lot of examples in the gaming industry where being first doesn't always matter. I mean, look at the Dreamcast. It was the first console of its generation. It flopped. The Wii U. It was the first console of its generation. It flopped. You see what I mean? 
Okay, moving on to 1996, this is when developers started to get a little more comfortable with 3D graphics, and especially since the Nintendo 64 was releasing this summer, Sony needed some good games to combat the competition. Parappa the Rapper! I love Parappa the Rapper! Often credited as the first rhythm slash music game, which isn't true because us Nintendo fans know that it was dance aerobics on NES. Yeah, love being first. Parappa the Rapper is a cute but also really weird rhythm game where you press the buttons to the rap. It's very simple, but it can be pretty challenging, especially in the later levels. The cutscenes and the actual rap scenes are pretty funny and weird, which is why I like this game. It's funny and weird. Tomb Raider also released in 96 on the PlayStation and Sega Saturn. It's an action-adventure game where you play as Lara Croft, an archaeologist who is searching for an ancient artifact. The game takes inspiration from the Indiana Jones films. You go around exploring and adventuring ancient ruins around the world. It's pretty cool. Okay, you can't mention the year 1996 in gaming without mentioning Super Mario 64, a revolutionary 3D platformer game, yada yada yada, you know the song and dance. Sony needed a game to combat Nintendo's fresh new Mario 64, so... Hey, plumber boy, mustache man, your worst nightmare has arrived. Crash Bandicoot. He could also be referred to as Sonic 2, not Sonic 2 as in Sonic 2, but the second Sonic, Mario's second rival. The rivalry is definitely not as fierce nowadays, I mean there's been Crash games on Nintendo consoles, and as a matter of fact, Sony doesn't even own Crash anymore, they belong to the Big Green now, not this Big Green, the other Big Green. The original Crash Bandicoot is a much more linear 3D platformer that is more like a 2D platformer turned 3D, while Mario 64 was a flat out 3 dimensional revolution. Despite being a great contender, it sold 6 million units, which is pretty good, but it was only half of Mario 64's 12 million. But there were more Crash games later down the line, so Crash Bandicoot was still a very strong and successful franchise. On to 1997. This was a strong year for Sony. Crash Bandicoot 2, Mega Man X4, Tomb Raider 2, Mortal Kombat 4. But this year marked the release of a game that not only changed gaming as a whole, but a game that changed some people's lives forever. Final Fantasy VII Squaresoft had all six of their Final Fantasy games and the rest of their franchises primarily on Nintendo consoles, but when Square saw that CDs held a lot more data than Nintendo 64 cartridges, they seized the opportunity to make bigger and better games. The impact that this title had on the gaming community is amazing, and while I haven't actually played through the game myself, I have a friend who literally won't shut up about it. All the game magazines were calling it Game of the Year, and even though I haven't played it, I can definitely see why people love this game. 1997 also saw the release of Gran Turismo, a racing simulation game, which was an absolute hit. It became the best-selling game on the console in the blink of an eye. It didn't have a selling gimmick or anything like that, people loved it just because it was one of the first truly great racing simulators. It had good controls, realistic movement and physics, and lots of actual real-world licensed cars. Another game that was released that year was Klonoa. It's 3D graphically, but 2D gameplay-wise, similar to Kirby 64 that would release later in the year 2000. Just a charming, cutesy platformer with a surprising amount of storytelling. You know, the more I think about it, I should give this game a try. Yeah, let me see if I can get it online or something. Well, I guess you can always admire its existence on the internet. There's one more game that I'd like to talk about that came out this year, and as I've said, I haven't actually played through Final Fantasy VII, but I think I already have my game of the year for 1997. Castlevania Symphony of the Night. I'm a Castlevania guy, I'm sure a few people know that by now, with my Castlevania 2 poster and my... Castlevania 2 poster. Symphony of the Night, similar to Final Fantasy VII, is one of the most critically acclaimed games of all time. Beautiful story, beautiful graphics, beautiful sound, beautiful everything. Again, I'm a Castlevania buff, Castlevania lore master if you will, so I have my bias, but no doubt this is one of the best, if not the best game on the PlayStation in my opinion. 1998 saw games like Resident Evil 2, Crash Bandicoot 3, Tomb Raider 3, Xenogears, yeah, pretty good titles. However, there was a bit of a problem this year. Nintendo put out 95% of the world population's favorite game, Ocarina of Time, and they also put out the global phenomenon that is Pokemon. 
While the PlayStation was still the best-selling console of that year, Nintendo wasn't gonna give up, but neither was Sony. This year we got Spyro the Dragon, a platforming adventure game that was even more three-dimensional than Crash's walking down a hall gameplay. The game has you exploring levels and freeing crystallized dragons and collecting gems and eggs. It's a neat game, it's another family-friendly game with some good humor. It's a nice time. The most notable game that was released this year, in my opinion, was Metal Gear Solid. It's a stealth-based game where you, Solid Snake, try to eliminate the terrorist threats of Foxhound, an elite special forces unit. This is another game like Final Fantasy VII and Symphony of the Night, where it's labeled as one of the all-time greats in gaming, and is considered one of the most important games of all time. It's a video game, but it's also a work of art, which can be said about a lot of games, but anyway, this game was a huge deal. It may not have been enough to stop Ocarina of Time, and I'm convinced that literally nothing can stop Pokemon, but it was an amazing game that still made the PS1 the highest selling console at the time. 1999, a strong year for sequels and spin-offs for the console. Sega released their new console, the Dreamcast, so Sony was going to try and put up a fight, even if they didn't really need to. Driver, a game where you drive around different cities in the United States. Sure, there's an actual story, but why would you do that when there's reckless driving to do? I prefer the game's sequel, Driver 2, which released a year later, but yeah, it's a silly reckless driving game. It's fun. Crash Team Racing. This is amazing. I love CTR so much, it's definitely one of my favorite kart racers for sure. It's not that deep, it's just a fun racing game but with characters from Crash. As someone who's always been a Mario Kart guy, I mean Mario Kart DS was the first game I ever remember playing, so when I find the, oh which one's better, Mario Kart 64 or CTR debate, even though I'm very biased towards Mario Kart and the Nintendo 64 for obvious reasons, I think CTR wins this one in my opinion. I think it controls better, and it also has that amazing adventure mode, so yeah, I gotta give this one to Crash. The PlayStation was still going strong even with the Dreamcast... existing. However, Sony announced that they were working on something that was going to be much bigger, a more powerful successor to the PlayStation. The PlayStation 2. With the new console releasing in spring, it meant that the PS1's life was coming to an end. I mean, there were still PS1 games throughout the 2000s, but realistically... 1999 was the last big year for the PlayStation. There was a remodel of the PlayStation dubbed the PS1 in summer of the year 2000, which did really well with 28 million units sold, and remember, that's just a console redesign. But overall, the PlayStation was a massive success. It was the first console to sell over 100 million units, and it showed that not everyone was going to flock to Nintendo just because they were Nintendo. I guess in summary, the PlayStation was successful for a lot of reasons. It used CDs so more storage demanding games could work on it while the Nintendo 64 cartridges could only hold a fraction of what CDs could. CDs also provided better audio quality and the console could be used as a CD player. The main reason why Sony won this war though was the games. With the help of third party developers and it being naturally easier to develop games for the PlayStation, it was destined to be victorious. So, what are my thoughts on it? I like it. In terms of charm and character, it's definitely my favorite PlayStation console. While the games are definitely what matters most, I love consoles just as much, and the PS1 is no exception. Even if there isn't a whole lot to it when it comes to booting up the console, just watching the boot up screen, looking through the menus, and when you put a game in and you see that black screen with the PlayStation logo and that epic sound, Yeah, it's a charming console. It's also terrifying, but I'll probably get into that some other time. But overall, this chunky gray slab is one funny little machine.